everyone. Welcome to the Drinks with Jess podcast. This is Jess Brown as your host, and this is where we bring the LGBT community together and its allies to share in each other's missions and help each other grow. We are in celebration mode because we have a new president and vice president. Yes, Mr. Biden, the new president-elect, and Miss Kamala Harris, the new VP elect i am so excited and of course joining me tonight is a man that all of you are familiar with because he has joined me through this entire election process mr nathan james journalist of nbc out huffington post hollywood digest buzzfeed you name it you see his work there and there is nobody better that i could celebrate this moment with mr james how you feeling man I am ecstatically happy to paraphrase President Gerald Ford, our long national nightmare is over, and we can start breathing easy again. Do you know, when when I heard the news, now I was streaming MSNBC, and Philadelphia just brought in a new count, and then seriously, two seconds later, all of a sudden it said projected winner and had Biden's picture. I didn't even wait. I ran outside screaming for my neighbor Nancy. I'm like, Nancy, Nancy, Nancy. And she comes walking out of her house. She's like, what? And I said, we have a new president. And like, that was it. I said, you better get a drink and come over here because we have to celebrate. And and that was it. Like, I didn't even take the time to exhale. And I think it's because I've been watching this nonstop, 24 hours a day for pretty much the past four days. Like, I don't know if I'm just excited for this or excited that I can finally take a nap. <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, uh, when you texted me earlier, I was out walking, and I passed by the firehouse, Engine 18, Ladder 18, Medic 21. I want to give them a quick shout-out, because as soon as it was clear that Biden was elected, they just let go of that hat with every siren attached to every vehicle they had in that firehouse. And... It was, a, it was a defining moment for me, because, you know, I just want to remind everybody that Biden is the president-elect because this was all Philadelphia. This was all Philly. That's this right. was all this is our Philadelphia. Town. This is our town. We you know, it. and I think But you know what, though? Pittsburgh did a wonderful job. And I have to say, I lived in Pittsburgh for eight years. I, I did my undergrad at the University of Pittsburgh. I love it, except that it's too far from the beach and the winters get damn cold. But other than that, it's such a beautiful city. And the fact that they came together, eerie which went Republican but now had turned blue. Even where I live in Delaware County, that was normally a, a conservative Republican area, and I hear a lot here, like I, I feel like I'm the black sheep in this area, but they went blue, Bucks County went blue. It, it was just a signal that we are over the tyranny, we are ready to have hope again, and it's, it's going to take a while. I remember the, one of the first times that you were on the show during the debate you know, situation, actually during the, the original um, Democratic debates. And I said that Trump was like a sick dog in the house. And don't fault anybody for not being able to get a lot of stuff done when they come in because he's shitting all over the yard or shitting all over our country. And there's going to be a lot to clean up, and that's going to take a lot of time. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's going to be – it's a tall order. It will be a tall order for any president following Trump into the White House, and it's going to be a, a multi-step process. First of all, we've got to get COVID-19 under control. And, and now we're way out of control. We are way out of control. Very much so. It's worse now than it, than it was even last spring. So the first step has to be to get COVID-19 under control, and I am absolutely confident that Biden will not only listen to the medical professionals, he will return medical professionals like Dr. Fauci to their rightful positions as the preeminent spokespeople for the medical community on epidemiological issues. Number two, Biden has to inculcate a sense of healing in the American psyche mm -hmm. because the United States at this point is a deeply traumatized country. Mm -hmm. And until we begin the process of healing, there is no going forward. Mm -hmm. And number three, yes, undoing the damage wrought by the Trump administration. That's more than a four-year project. Right. And it's going to be up to Biden to lay the foundation and make a start. 
And this for Kamala so to finish it up when she becomes president is what I like to think. Yes, I, I could see Kamala running and being elected four years from now. She but was still my present, favorite. She was still my favorite. In was... the present, in the present, though, both Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will have their work cut out for them. Mm -hmm. Just in reversing some of the things that Trump has done, undoing the damage that he has caused, and restoring confidence both in the United States and around the world in the process of our republic government that Trump has so thoroughly disemboweled during his time in office. Right, of course. And it's, it's not to go without saying, and I want everybody to remember that President-elect Biden— and Vice President-elect Harris do not take office until January 20th at noon, which means we have about two and a half months where Trump can still cause a lot of damage. I mean, he, he could try and tank the stock market. Obviously, COVID's not getting any better. And obviously, this morning with Mark Meadows coming out saying he tested positive, you know, I'm sure they're going to have to fumigate the White House before they even move in. But, uh, I mean, really, like, fumigate the White House. with, uh, with they, should have they should have to fumigate it anyway, COVID or not, after this one. But there is going to be something, there is going to be a lot of damage that he can still take. I mean, he can press the red button for all we know at this point with the amount of rage that he has. I heard he was on the golf course this morning, and then they, they called Pennsylvania and the tweets started rolling and i i feel as if the advisors to the current administration should have had that conversation with king lear to pretty much let it be set in reality so he's not just looking at an image in a mirror that's cracked at this point just to at least make it known that you know it's not looking so good Let's talk about how you are going to go through this process, because already he's stating he's not going to Inauguration Day, which is fine because we don't want him there. We don't need the bad energy. He's not going to welcome the Bidens into the White House. I mean, even Obama and uh, Barack and Michelle welcomed the Trumps into the White House. You know, it's, it seems as if he's going to be even less presidential than what he already is in this moment. You're right. And, you know, here's the thing. Trump has said several times that he would not accept peaceful transfer of power should he lose the election. Mm -hmm. And I do not expect him to go quietly. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. I think he's going to institute a scorched earth strategy between now and January 20th. And he's going to be taking revenge on those he feels are his political enemies, on fellow Republicans he felt let him down, and on the country as a whole for repudiating him. Mm -hmm. Because this election was definitely a referendum on Trump's presidency. Now, that being said, I can also see Trump doing some very shady things. I think that on January 16th, Trump's going to go to Walter Reed Hospital for some undisclosed procedure. He's going to name Mike Pence as his acting president. Mike Pence, as acting president the next day, will pardon Trump, his family, and all his minions. And then on the third day, Trump will return from the Walter Reed Medical Center, and he will be recovered from his procedure, spend the last two days in office, and then the federal government will not be able to go after him for what we know are his many New high crimes misdemeanors. But the state of New York still can. Yes, and I don't think Tish James is going to play around either. Letitia think... James, that's the first thing I said to my mother today. I said, Letitia James must be like a kid in a candy store right now. And I love her. She is strong. She is smart. She does her due diligence. She does her research. She knows her stuff. And I know that she is... She was probably waiting for this moment to finally say, okay, now I can start putting my cards on the table. Not only for Trump, but for his family, because there is a possibility that he would want to make a run in 2024 to redeem his image or even put up Ivanka or Donald Jr. Because you and I have had a, a chat behind the scenes where Donald Jr. was thinking about coming to Pennsylvania, running for Senate because Pat Toomey is retiring and and or not running again for office and then trying to run for the presidency. And, I, you know. 
I know that we have had some dynasties in our day. I mean, we, we have the Bush boys. I, you know what? Jeb Bush was actually the governor of Florida when I lived there, and he's a very upstanding guy. I didn't necessarily agree with his policies, but he was pretty upstanding. George Jr., in his, in his older days, has become a very um, proud American who has stood up for what's right. And, it, and he always seemed to be congenial. And, and George Herbert, Wa you know, Walker Bush, you know, George Sr., mm -hmm. as much as I didn't agree with him, he was still a good man. You know, I am not, not anti-Republican, and I will state this, and I have stated this before. I am not anti-Republican. I just don't like assholes. If you're going to be an asshole, then you're not going to be my friend, whether you're Democrat or Republican. And I can see some genuine nature as some of the presidents have gotten older where they seem to get along really well. I mean, look at look at John McCain, God rest his soul, and, and Joe Biden. I mean, they, they could fight on the debate stage. They could fight on the Senate floor. But then they were having drinks and dinner together afterwards. Well, you know, a uh, very old Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, you remember Tip? Mm -hmm. Tip O'Neill had a very famous saying. He said that in, in congressional chambers, we fight like cats and dogs, but after 6 o'clock, we're all the best of friends. And, of course, he was speaking to this tradition that whichever side of the aisle you're on, you put your differences down when you're not in session, and you treat each other as respected colleagues. Now, of course, Trump has torn all that down during his time in office. He has upended the concept of respectable adversarial procedures that we normally see in a normal government. Mm -hmm. now, now, that being said, I don't think anyone whose last name ends in Trump, who was part of the White House administration, should be anywhere but in a prison cell in 2024. Because uh, that's where they family. belong. Put the whole family in there. Just put them. Just put them in there. They they have caused enough trouble. And you know what? Put Bill Barr in there. Because and, they're all complicit. In, <laughs> they're, they're all complicit in what Trump did. And Trump himself not only has things to answer for as president, he still has things to answer for in criminal court that he carried out before he was president. And again, I think Tish James is not going to pussyfoot around. I think she's going to nail him to the wall with indictment after indictment, and there will be nothing he can do about it because the pardon power of the federal government does not extend to local crimes. Right, of course, of course. Now, I know that at this point, you know, Mr. Biden and Ms. Harris have, have already been working on and with experts, whether it's for coronavirus or the economy, I know that they are setting up their plan. I have not seen, because I refused to look until I saw the call, as far as the transition team. I'm sure it's going to be a very good team. But I'm also looking at who he's going to bring into the cabinet. And I've had my picks for a long time. But also, knowing that our Senate is 48 to 48 right now, as far as the current election, I know there's going to be two runoffs in Georgia. I would love to see a tie in the Senate. And Ossoff, the way he came after Purdue at the last debate that they had, and after, you know, and then Purdue said that he wasn't going to have another one because Ossoff really called him out and he couldn't answer. But I think it's important for people now that we have the president elect to focus on the Senate because Mitch McConnell did re win re-election. And if they are the majority, that means he could possibly stop any type of plan that the new administration could bring. Susan Collins, and I'm really iffy about her because for all the times that she said she wouldn't vote with the administration, but then she did. And, oh, he learned his lesson, but then he didn't, and then she did it again. I'm very surprised that Sarah, Sarah Gideon did not win. And I'm also very concerned that Harrison didn't win and Lindsey Graham was there. And Lindsey Graham used to say that Biden was one of the most upstanding men that he's ever worked with. So where are we taking this? Because it's important for people to understand that just, you know, Joe and Kamala alone cannot make all the changes. It does come up to Congress. 
and it does come up to the American people. So, yes, Biden and, and Harris have to forge their way, and especially with the Trump supporters that have brain, been brainwashed for the past four years, they are going to have to make that reconciliation and and let them understand that they are here for everyone and hope that they see the light and come out of that dark space that they've been in for four years. And this includes the QAnon people and all the crazies. But the Senate, unless there's a 50-50 tie where, where Senator Harris would, as VP, be the tiebreaker, you know, there does need to be some kind of understanding of how important these Senate runoffs, especially in Georgia, are going to be. Yeah, and, and I, you know, what I think that the new balance of power in the Senate, and I do think both Democrats that have to do the runoff in Georgia will prevail, is it will give pre President-elect Biden a little bit more leverage. Mitch McConnell will not be the all-powerful fire-breathing dragon that he was during the Trump years. And that's important because if any legislation is to be passed, if anything is to get done, in the legislative branch, Ms. Mm -hmm. McConnell and his cronies have to be brought to heel, mm -hmm. which which is going to be another challenge for uh, Biden-Harris administration. And as you mentioned, Kamala Harris will become the president of the Senate, so she will have some influence over the pace at which legislation gets brought through. There's not going to be any more stonewalling as there was with Trump's impeachment or with the Coronavirus Stimulus Act, which is still waiting to be passed in mm -hmm. Congress. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are things, in other words, what I'm saying is that Biden and Harris will be better able to conduct the people's business, and so will the Democrats in Congress, because we're seeing a seismic shift mm -hmm. in the balance of power in Washington. Right. which has been sorely needed for a long time. And, and we've been seeing, we're seeing that shift all over the country in, in states. I mean, look at Georgia. And I think this is especially attributed to Stacey Abrams because after she lost the, the governor election to Kemp, which, by the way, she should not have lost. I, I think there, I mean, talk about voter fraud. It was definitely fraud and, and, and oppression uh, in Georgia at that time. But she really steamrolled the Democratic vote there and, and got the people engaged and let them understand how important this vote was going to be and how they could stop that voter oppression and have their voices be heard. And I, I, I really want to give credit to Stacey Abrams because right now, even though it hasn't been called it, it, while we're recording this, it has not been called for Georgia. And I know that they're going to go into a recount, but Biden did pull ahead. And I, I really do owe that to not only Stacey Abrams, but the other communities, all the minority communities in Georgia, whether whether they were religious minorities or ethnic minorities or race minorities, it, they really pulled together and, and came out and let their voices be heard and not be afraid of it and not be scared and not just push it aside saying, well, our voices don't matter. Like she really pulled that community together and all those organizations together to allow the community to know, you know what, it's our time. It is our time. And I think that's a really important fact because I think after seeing that, we're going to see that for elections to come. I do. I do. And you know what Stacey Abrams did in Georgia critically underscores how important get out the vote drives really are. And she got serious and she said, okay, you stole the gubernatorial election from me. I'm going to show you how to take back a presidential election. Mm -hmm. She went out, she did the work in the streets and the community, and that's why we have the result we see in Georgia today. Mm -hmm. I don't think at this, I, I don't think at this point that a recount is going to change a great deal in Georgia. Mm -hmm. It's still going to be awarded to Biden when all is said and done. Mm -hmm. And if Joe Biden doesn't find a position in his cabinet for Stacey Abrams, I'll be very, very surprised. You know he should. He will. You know he will. I, I think that that she and Pete Buttigieg should be part of a Biden cabinet. Mm -hmm. And I also think he should find a way to get a couple of pioneers, innovators, like DeRay McKeeson. Mm -hmm. And uh, like DeRay McKeeson and, uh, dare I say it, like Cory Booker. 
into cabinet level positions mm -hmm. because these are the people with the forward vision and the progressive vision that will guide him in a direction that I, I almost hesitate to use the phrase, but that a normal presidency should go. Right. And I, I think he's, he's going to pick the right people. He's going to pick the best people. He's going to utilize their strengths. I mean, that's, that's one of the things of a good leader. They say this in business, and, and they can say that in government. You don't know everything as a leader. So it's surrounding yourself that, with the people who have the knowledge of those specific areas. I would love to see Pete Buttigieg in the Secretary of Defense position. He's mm -hmm. a vet. I, I, and plus, with what happened with the trans ban and everything else, I think he would be an absolutely wonderful representative of that. I would have loved to seen uh, um, Elizabeth Warren as the Secretary of the Treasury. She's very, very smart when it comes to that. I would love to see Michael Bennett as the um, a Director of Education. You know, I, it, there are there are certain things, even even who was it Inslee? He would be wonderful for the environment because right now we have somebody who really had a lot of lawsuits regarding the EPA and and all the rollbacks. I mean, there's no reason why he should have been in there in the first place, but obviously he was a friend of Trump and and that's how it went. He was a big donor, but Biden's going to pick his cabinet members not only that have the knowledge. But it wasn't necessary to donate to his campaign in order to get that position. He's going to pick the people the right way. And I just, you know, for a man who has, for a man who's been in government for 50 years, I mean, think about it, 50 years. And he ran for president twice, third time's a charm. And it was his time. Maybe the other times were not his time, but now it is his time. And I, I think Dr. Joe Biden is going to be a wonderful first lady. And we need somebody yep. in there with some kind of knowledge of education, especially in the urban areas, which she was. But uh, and, and, and and can can we can we get Joe to put Fauci in charge of the CDC already and be done with it? I you know what I think he will, and I'll tell you why. Because the first thing he said was, "Fauci, don't worry about it. You're going to have a job with me." Fauci is Dr. Fauci. First of all, I love him. He is one of the prime members. And, and probably the most esteemed uh, infectious disease doctor. He is so knowledgeable and he is so honest. And I, I love how he kind of pulled away from the administration, but he was still doing interviews to get himself out there. And I love on 60 Minutes how he said, yeah, he felt kind of silenced. Uh, now, Dr. Burks, I will say this. My father, as a physician, uh, during the 80s, he used to go see Dr. Burks speak because she was from Carlisle and, and he worked at, at the hospitals in Lancaster and had a private practice. And she was very well esteemed for her job with, with the AIDS epidemic and uh, infectious diseases. And then she kind of sold out. But if you noticed in the past couple of months, she kind of went away and she's been like going across the country telling people the importance of masks and social distancing. So she she's actually kind of released herself from the administration, which I think saved her. She was not one of those who was going to die going down with the ship, like a lot of the GOP members that we see. I, I still think her her credibility has probably been ruined at this point, but Fauci mm -hmm. has not ruined his. So I would love to see him as the head of the CDC. I think that would be phenomenal. I don't think there would be anybody better. And I would love to see, and I know he says that he's going to stay the governor and that he loves his state of New York and wants to do whatever it can to, to make sure that New York is always okay and its citizens are okay. But I have to say over all this time, especially with the coronavirus, I, even as a lesbian, I fell in love with Governor Cuomo. Nobody has handled this better and brought his people together like Governor Cuomo has. Well, Governor Cuomo was certainly very pro proactive, and I will say this. He was one of the, the quickest to respond. He was one of the quickest to respond when the virus really started to get serious in New York, particularly in the five boroughs. Mm -hmm. And what we had, if you remember, was, excuse me, just one moment. That's better. What we had, if you remember, was that we had a hodgepodge 
of state standards for responding to the virus. State A was doing one thing, state B was doing another, and that's one of the reasons it got out of control. We did not have a uniform standard that was developed by the federal government. Remember, Trump threw the Obama playbook out. I'm pretty sure one of the first things Biden's going to do is take that playbook back. But one of the things that's particularly salient with Governor Cuomo is just about everything he did in New York was an element in the Obama administration's pandemic response playbook. Mm -hmm. So that should tell you something about where his thinking was at. Mm -hmm. And this is what I mean when I say undoing the damage. We have so much that needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, let's have a school teacher actually be in charge of the education department again. I told you, one day I will run for office, Nathan. You know, you should you should send a letter to Biden. If, and, 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 if you draft that letter for me, I will send it. I will do that. I will do that. Okay. But but again, you know, getting the right people, like you said, in the right jobs, qualified people that know what they're doing, instead of being political appointees or somebody who just tells the president what they want to hear. And and while we're on that, you know, let's talk about Kamala for a minute. Uh, first, now, wait, before you say anything, this, first of all, has been an historic moment. Uh, Kamala Harris, Senator Harris, number one was was one of was actually my number one pick during the um, DNC candidacy, but she uh, has been a trailblazer for a long time. But now she is the first woman vice president elect, and we've had several vice uh, a couple of vice uh, I believe it's three vice presidential women candidates on the ticket. But she is the first woman vice presidential elect and the first woman of color. And th this says so much to, I know, me and other communities and, and all around the world that it's time. I always said back in the day, I always said, you know what? If a woman was running things, it's like the women's caucus. Just take them to lunch and they'll have half of the world problems solved. In an hour, well, you know, and it's it's about time that there is a woman in the vice presidential or hopefully later on the presidential position because they take care of business and they do it in a way because they are emotional. They do it in a way that they feel what others feel, which is not something often that a man can do, although Joe Biden can because he has been through so much between, you know, the death of his first wife and his daughter, and then the death of his son. I mean, he is somebody who has gone through personal obstacles and personal grief and has still overcome. Yeah, Biden has overcome tragedies that, that, that are just, uh, just uh, horrendous to contemplate. And he has risen above them, and he has risen to this position of leadership, and he's brought Kamala with him, which I think uh, is going to go a long way towards healing our country. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, not only is it historic in its own right that Kamala is the vice president-elect, but you know, we have a long history in this country of somehow creating this, this myth that a person's gender determines their ability to perform a particular function. Right. At this sense, nowhere been more true than when we talk about whether the country is, quote, unquote, ready to elect a woman president or vice president. You know, it, this, this has been happening in third world countries throughout the years mm -hmm. that women have been elected president. So, like, I feel like we're kind of, like, late to the game. It's, it's just kind of counterintuitive because, again, you know, we, we've had this glass ceiling on president and vice president for our entire history. Mm -hmm. There have only been two women that have actually run for president, and uh, they were Chisholm and Clinton. Mm -hmm. But even in 2016, I think that there was such an element of misogyny in the air, mm -hmm. and that was an obstacle, an insurmountable one. For Hillary Clinton to overcome, mm -hmm. and she was running against. Think about this now. She was running against the most boorish, the most misogynistic, 
the most repulsive candidate vis-a-vis -vis women in America, mm -hmm. and still 53% of the female electorate voted for Trump. So to see Kamala finally be elected and elevated to be the vice president, and again, I do think she will successfully run to be president in her own right in four years. I hope so. I hope uh, so. You know, this is this is a watershed moment in American history. It really, really is, because not only was the past election a referendum on Trump, it was also a confirmation that finally we have reached a level of maturity, at least in half the country, to elect a woman to be vice president of the United States. You know, I like every time I sigh, I get chills because I'm so happy. Like, I feel like four years of grief and tyranny are now over because it really could have been much, much worse. And it, I, I mean, I don't know how much worse, but then again, like 2020 has proved like you just can't estimate anything. But I, I, along with, with a, a lot of other Americans, no matter who you are, feel a sense of relief. I'm sure that the people who voted for Trump um, are feeling very sad right now, and that's okay. There is a lot to diffuse. I'm sure the next couple of days are going to be very volatile, if not weeks. But it, it seems as if the, the dark clouds now have a peak of sunlight through them. And for that, I am very excited. And for all of you out there, if you notice, we didn't take a break because this is a celebratory moment. I have just finished my big glass of wine. I actually broke out the, the glass of wine. But, Nathan, there's nobody better that I could celebrate this with and have conversation with you. And for the rest of you out there, uh, I didn't say this at the beginning, and we didn't take a break because I was very, very excited about this news. In fact, Nathan and I were scheduled to record later on in the day, and as soon as I found the news out, I, I said that we, we got to roll very, very soon. But uh, for all of you out there, make sure you go on to dwjphl.com for all of our social media links and links to our archive shows, and especially check out this show. You can also find us on um, any of your favorite po podcast platforms, including YouTube, to watch us. And make sure you check out the Be The Voice Podcast Network, not only for information about the show, but all the others on the Be The Voice Podcast Network. But you know what the best thing is, Nathan? I have been wearing blue, and I have navy blue on right now, but I have been wearing blue since the, I think, debate started. I said, uh, well, actually, no, since Kamala was um, picked as the VP running mate, and I said, I will wear blue for every show. Do you know how happy I am to know that next week's show, I will be back in a black t-shirt? Right. Like, how I, excited I, am I? Like, I have been, like, out of sorts because I've been in blue every show that I've done for this whole time. And it's 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 actually becoming a part of me, but I cannot wait to get back to my black T-shirts and take a nap. <laughs> and we're finally there. Uh, I know. We really are. But, Nathan, you will be joining me again because I'm sure in the next two months we still are going to have a lot to talk about. And for all of you out there, make sure you check out Nathan's work. I will make sure that I share his posts online and um, go out and celebrate tonight because now change is coming. Have a good night.